Hello everyone. My name is Beth Mahaffey with Highway to Holiness. Today we're going to be talking about patterns in Scripture. There's basically three different kinds of patterns that we can find in Scripture. The first one are parallels. Next are chiasms or concentric structures and what I call thematic patterns. We will discuss what each of these are, but eventually we will place most of our emphasis on understanding thematic patterns. A parallel is a unit of text with themes in a particular order that's usually repeated immediately after the first unit is completed in the same passage of Scripture. An example of this is found in Acts 24, where Paul defends himself from being accused of profaning the temple. In A1, which is verses 11 through 13, real facts and denial of charges are presented. In B1, which is verses 14 through 16, confession of belief in resurrection is stated. And then in A2, which is where the parallel begins to repeat itself, this is found in verses 17 through 19, where the real facts and denial of charges are made again. And B2 is verses 20 through 21, where confession of belief in the resurrection is made again. And normally what I do with a parallel is I set it up in a chart, such as this one on the right. In the first row I have the themes A1 and A2. And then in the second row I have the themes B1 and B2. And then in the third column, sometimes what I do is I write my comments there when I'm comparing and contrasting what I'm looking at. Chiastic and concentric structures are inverted parallels. They're a unit of text with themes in a particular order that is immediately repeated in reverse order in the same passage of Scripture. Now normally the central portion is the focus or the most important part of the structure. However, on rare occasions the most important part could be the inclusios, which is the outermost portions or the bookends of the structure. A chiasm is an inverted parallel. It can be single-centered. An example of this would be Acts 2, which talks about the Holy Spirit. A1 begins with verse 41. The theme found there is evangelization. Next is B1, which is found in verse 42. The theme here is common life. Then we have C1, which is found in verse 43. The themes there are signs and wonders. And then we see a reversal taking place. And we have B2, which is verses 44 through 47a, where it talks about common life again. And then we have A2, which is verse 47b, which talks about evangelization again. And what I want to do normally when I'm looking at a chiasm like this is I want to set up a chart and in the first column I'll have A1, B1, and C1. And if there are any more that we need to look at, those will continue. And then it, when it reverses order, I'll have the B2 lined up with the B1, and then the A2 lined up with A1. And then I will still have comments when I'm comparing and contrasting those, and we'll have the theme for A and B and C, as you can see here in this chart. These can also be double-centered. You may see these referred to as concentric structures. An example of this is Acts 8, where we have the account of the Ethiopian eunuch. A1 verse 30c is where Philip said something. B1 is verse 31 part A, where the eunuch said something. C1 is verse 31b, where the eunuch makes his invitation to Philip to join him. C2 is verse 32 through 33, which is the eunuch's passage. B2 is verse 34, where the eunuch said something again. And then A2 is verse 35, where Philip said something. Now we can take this and set it up in a chart similar to this one here on the right. In the first column we have A1, B1, C1. In the second column we have A2, B2, and C2. And then we can make our comments in that third column for each theme. There are other forms of literary structures similar to this. 
you may see something that has A1, B1, C1, D1, and then it reverses order B2 and C2, and then that B2, C2 is actually a unit in itself that compares to the previous B1, C1. And then this could be followed by A2. So it's not a full reversal, but it's more like a reversal with those groups B and C. Often, the reason for the structure can vary. An example of that would be the first portion of the structure could be a command to do something, and then the second portion may state how the instructions were carried out and what the results were, and any opposite results may be due to the commands not being followed correctly. Thematic patterns are essentially parallels, but they're different because they're not in the same portion of Scripture like regular and inverted parallels are. These portions of Scripture, at first glance, may or may not even appear to be related to one another at all. However, these parallels do have the same series of themes that occur in an order relatively similar to that of the original pattern, and that's why we're interested in them and why they could be useful for something. Now I want you to understand thematic patterns are not something that someone is in the habit of doing. That's a pattern of behavior, and that's not what we're talking about here. If a theme in one scriptural account is not present in each parallel of the thematic pattern, that theme may not be part of the pattern. However, it could be considered to be an item of opposition if it's sometimes present in a few of the parallels being examined, but not all of them. Opposition can be an opposite theme, or it can be a lack of a theme. Bear in mind that parallel themes can be literal, and I mean they can be actual, such as death or resurrection or rebirth. They can also be figurative, and in that sense I'm talking about something that could be typological or a picture of the actual theme. This could be something like descending into a pit or a cistern or jail, and this is a picture of death. You could also see someone being lifted or brought out of a pit or a cistern or jail, or someone being vomited out of a fish onto dry land and given new life, and all of that is a picture of resurrection or rebirth. And sometimes you can have mixtures of literal and figurative themes that can be present in a pattern, so you just need to bear that in mind. Opposition to themes in your parallels may occur, and this is normal. An example of that would be birth versus death, hidden versus revealed, possess versus dispossess, fall versus rise. Another thing that you might encounter is what I call duality, in which there are similar or opposite themes happening in a single step or in a single row of your chart. An example of this could be that one person lives while another one dies, or someone is hidden and another one dies. Now that one that's hidden, although they're alive, that could also be a picture of death. So you kind of have to move with the flow of things. When you're studying scripture, you may find yourself thinking that what you're reading sounds similar to something else that you've read. There's probably a parallel that you need to examine and see if that's the case. More often than not, at first glance, parallel patterns may not appear to be related to one another at all. However, their shared thematic pattern ties them together. Sometimes finding parallels are not so obvious. Sometimes you have to ask yourself what themes you see in your passage and try to find something similar. You often don't know you have a parallel for sure until you attempt to look at them side by side. The whole point of finding and analyzing thematic patterns is either the nugget or gold mine of information that God may reward you with if you make the effort to compare and contrast each row of your parallels to see what God wants to teach you. It may be that something you're looking at from the Tanakh, or the Old Testament, is a picture of an aspect of Yeshua's life or that of the believer. It may be something that sheds light on something of typological significance, and it may be something else entirely. 
Now I know that what I've been saying so far is kind of abstract, but I need to share a bit more information before we can see an example. And once we see an example, I think that a lot of this will fall into place. When I find and examine thematic parallels, I put them in a chart, I compare and contrast each row, and ask myself questions about how they are related and what conclusions I can reach about how they are related. I pray and ask that God would show me what He wants me to see and learn. I then record my thoughts and comments in the last column of my chart and or make a merged row for that purpose. Now here's an example of what I'm trying to talk about. Depending on what's going on, I try to give my chart a title after I kind of see everything that's going on. And in the left column, on the far left, I indicate what the original pattern is right here. And then if I see this pattern operating in another portion of Scripture, I'll put it in parallel 1 and I'll be indicating the same themes. For example, we might have the themes of baptism, anointing, temptation, ministry, death, and life. And that list or that order of those themes is what is setting the pattern. And I might see those same themes in the similar order in another portion of Scripture that I might call parallel two. And then still a third maybe in parallel three and yet another for parallel four. The original pattern always goes in the first column and it contains a series of themes that are seen in a particular portion of Scripture. And these same themes can play out in other portions of Scripture as I've described. Now sometimes you may choose to put more than one theme in a row depending on the order of events, but that's up to you. I'm just trying to give you an idea how this is done. Now how can we further describe and explain thematic patterns? What else can they be compared to? This mosaic of colors to the left may represent the events in a historical narrative. These events are unique for a particular passage of Scripture, and each color may represent a different set of themes in the historical account. In this mosaic, we may choose to only look at the themes or events in the white portions of this historical account. The other colors are part of the historical account, but they're not part of the white thematic pattern that we are trying to look at. We want to bring all of the themes related to the white color to the foreground and leave all the other themes or other colors in the background. Then we want to compare the themes represented by the white color to other passages of Scripture that may have the same set of themes to see what God may want to show us. Sometimes there could be more than one thematic pattern in a portion of Scripture, depending on how you look at it. An example of this would be if you're looking at all of the different Levitical sacrifices. We could say that the red color in this mosaic forms another thematic pattern which would have a set of themes that could possibly be compared to other portions of Scripture that are different from the ones that the white portions of Scripture were compared with. Again, our goal is to choose to look at themes from a certain portion of Scripture that forms a certain thematic pattern. We want to bring these themes, such as what's in the white colors, to the foreground. There may be other themes that are present in a scriptural account that are not part of the pattern. They are comparable to the non-white portions of this mosaic, and they need to remain in the background. Initially, you won't know what should be in the foreground or the background until you start examining other portions of Scripture with themes similar to what you're focusing on. Sometimes you have to have three or more parallels to know for sure. Look for shared themes in all of your parallels. Because the steps of a pattern can contain multiple and or opposite themes, we must use caution when interpreting thematic patterns. To properly identify the themes and see their significance, it's best to have three or more repeated pattern parallels to compare and contrast. Thematic patterns that are found in Scripture can be seen in our own lives today. If you see a scriptural pattern playing out in your own life, you can often know how to respond to your particular situation based on what took place in Scripture. In addition, if you see it happening in someone else's life, 
you can probably have a good idea how things are going to play out as the future unfolds. We're going to see some examples of a thematic pattern from the presentation, The Significance of the New Moon. This was a presentation that I made several years ago, and I do intend to redo or update the New Moon series. This particular presentation was a bit different because of the original thematic pattern, which was based on a modification of the phases of the moon, as well as what we see during the seasons of the year. And normally I do not look at patterns that are outside the biblical text, but just in this particular project that I was working on, I did that. The purpose of my initial investigation for this several years ago was to determine if the Hillel calendar's use of conjunction as the birth of the new moon was correct or not. And it was also to see if sighting the new moon was best. The results were really surprising to me. For our purposes, I created a hybrid of the moon phases. Full moon includes the first quarter, waxing gibbous, full moon, waning gibbous, and a third quarter as a, quote, time of life. And so I set up my chart with this being the original pattern. As I said before, I don't normally start a thematic pattern outside of scripture. However, for this project, this was just something I felt God led me to do. And first, what we're doing is we're looking outside the corpus of scripture and understanding what the pattern is and how we see it playing out all around us. For the lunar cycle, we see the full moon, we see a waning crescent, then conjunction, and then we see the new waxing crescent. Now, if we're considering the seasons of the year, we would consider summer to be in line with the full moon and autumn or fall to be in line with the waning crescent and winter to correspond to conjunction and spring as corresponding to the new waxing crescent. If we're looking just at the deciduous trees, we'll notice that during the time when it's in its full life cycle, the leaves are green. And then eventually in autumn, those leaves change and the colors change and they fall off. And this would correspond to the waning crescent period of time. And remember, we're thinking in terms of themes. And then after that, we have a period of dormancy that takes place in winter. And it lasts about three months. And this kind of corresponds to the idea of conjunction. But next, in spring, the leaves, they begin to bud and we start to see new life forming. And so this kind of corresponds with the moon phase of the new waxing crescent. But we also see this cycle taking place in the human life cycle. We can compare the period of the child through the adult years to the full moon, that full time of life. And then as an adult becomes elderly, their health declines and we can see that things are waning in their life and so that is comparable to the waning crescent. The period of conjunction, on the other hand, it can correspond to a baby's hiddenness during pregnancy, but then again it can also correspond to death and burial. And a newborn baby, as well as resurrection, can also correspond to the new waxing crescent. Now we're going to take this thematic pattern that we saw in the first column and compare it with its scriptural parallels. And each parallel to the pattern will be on separate slides. First, we're going to take a look at the baker and the cupbearer, which is found in Genesis 40 verses 1 through 22. And I want you to see what's going on there and how they kind of compare with our cycle here. During the time of full life, the baker and the cupbearer served Pharaoh. This is when they were kind of, you know, at their peak by that point in their lives. But eventually something happened that caused them to fall out of favor with Pharaoh. Next, they were imprisoned, which is a picture of hiddenness with Joseph. The baker and the cupbearer each had dreams that symbolized three days. And after three days, the baker died and then next, the cupbearer was given new life. He returned to serve at Pharaoh's side. And so in this story, we see a similarity in themes with the lunar cycle and with the other cycles that we just covered. 
Now let's look at David in 1 Samuel chapter 20. David's early life eventually led to his service to King Saul. And this is his period of life where he, at that point in time, was in his fullness. David's early life in service to King Saul would be comparable to that phase of the full moon at that point in time of David's early life and service. But at some point in time along the way, David, he suspects that he's fallen out of favor with King Saul, and he doesn't really know why. But David believed that King Saul wants to kill him. A three-day test to hide in the field was arranged between Jonathan and David before the new moon. Saul tried to kill Jonathan with a spear, and then Jonathan sent David away. David was hiding from King Saul until after the death of Saul and Jonathan. And then finally, David becomes king of Judah. So we can see in this story these same themes taking place. At first, we may think the theme of astronomical conjunction in our pattern, which is taking place around the time of the new moon in this historical account, is significant. But we need to be very cautious as we interpret what we're seeing. It's really comparable to a non-white color in our pattern, and we'll see why shortly. Instead, the themes of hiddenness and death are the proper themes associated with conjunction. Now let's look at the account of Jonah. Jonah was enjoying life until the Ninevites fell out of favor with Yehovah. And Yehovah told Jonah to go to Nineveh and cry out against it. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish. He paid the fare for a boat and went down into it. During a storm, he was thrown overboard by the others. He was hidden in the belly of a great fish for three days and nights. He described his death in the sea in a prayer to Yehovah. After Yehovah spoke to the fish, it vomited Jonah out alive onto the dry land, and he later preached to the Ninevites. I hope that you can see how these themes are being repeated in account after account. Now let's see what we can see in the life of Yeshua. Instead of beginning at that full moon phase, let's drop down to the bottom there where Yeshua was born. Remember, this is a cycle. This is something that happens repeatedly in one way or another. So we're going to start with the new waxing crescent where Yeshua was born. Yeshua grew up and began ministry around the age of 30 as the light of the world and the Son of God. And at some point, Yeshua did not have the favor of the religious leaders. This is the beginning of the ending of Yeshua's life. Yeshua, the Passover lamb, was arrested and crucified near the time of the full moon, which is the 14th of Nisan. Actually, the full moon can take place somewhere between the 14th and 16th of the lunar month. His body was pierced with a spear. He was taken down and buried. He was hidden in a tomb for three days and nights. And then after that, Yeshua was resurrected as firstfruits from the dead. So I hope that you can see how these themes are continuing to play out in the lives of different people. As we saw earlier, David and Jonathan's three-day test of being hidden in the field included the time of the new moon. But Yeshua's death took place during a time of darkness on Nisan 14th, just before the complete full moon on Nisan 15th. He was hidden in the tomb during the next three days and nights. Since these moon phases are completely opposite, we can't use that to reach the conclusion of what the significance of the new moon is during conjunction. In addition, the moon phase is not mentioned in another parallel such as Jonah, and so we have to really be careful and make sure that we're looking at this correctly. In fact, this is why we need to have more than two parallels when we're examining something. Remember, opposition is okay, and it's not unusual in some patterns, but it's not part of our themes that are present in that row of all our pattern parallels. Our focus is not to be on the dates and actual moon phases at the time of these parallels. It's to be on the picture of hiddenness or death as seen in our parallels. The theme for conjunction is hiddenness, because that's what the moon does around conjunction. The time of the moon's hiddenness that is around the exact moment of conjunction is about three days. 
Because the steps of a pattern can contain multiple or opposite themes, we must use extreme caution when interpreting thematic patterns. To properly identify the themes and see their significance, it's best to have three or more repeated pattern parallels to compare and contrast. If you don't, there may be a risk of an error in your interpretations. Now let's continue to look at this thematic pattern in Scripture. Next is Yeshua post-resurrection. It begins when Yeshua shows proof of his life. Next, Yeshua ascended from the earth, and previous to that the Father was well pleased with him. Yeshua is now hidden from our sight, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Notice we have a shift going on here. Instead of descending, like leaves do in the fall, we have seen that Yeshua ascended from the earth. That is a form of opposition. Now let's see what's going on with the lawless one. Lawlessness is fully at work in the earth. And then the restrainer, a form of light, will be removed from the earth. At that point, it's likely that Yehovah will not be pleased with the nations. And so we see that we have some opposition taking place in these two parallels that are going on. Next, the lawless one, who is over the kingdom of darkness, will be revealed. And then we'll have the time of tribulation. In our nature chart, the tree leaves fell to the earth, and here there's opposition. Yeshua and the Ruach HaKodesh, the restrainer of the Holy Spirit, do not fall out of favor with Yehovah. However, they must leave the earth by ascending to heaven. Now let's see how this finishes out at the level of the new waxing crescent. Yeshua, the light of the world, will return at the appointed time, which is unknown. He will be seen coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will lead the battle against the lawless one. Based on thematic analysis of scripture, full moon represents a full life. Waning crescent represents falling out of favor. Conjunction represents hiddenness or death. And new crescent moon represents birth or rebirth, new life, and Yeshua's return. Now, how would we apply this information to the Hebraic calendar? I think it's a little tricky, but I think we can do it. We have to have a day of the moon's death and a day of the new moon. There can only be 29 or 30 days in a lunar month. A conjunction, which is also known as the astronomical new moon, is only a moment in time which occurs at the same time all over the world at the end of a lunar cycle. It should be the last day of the lunar month, not the first day, as we see in the Hillel calendar. A new lunar moon really begins the moment after conjunction, even though it may still be dark. This correlates with Yeshua rising from the dead at sunset on a Saturday evening, three nights and three days after his death. So let's look at that. Yeshua was actually seen Sunday morning, yet he rose from the dead much sooner at the beginning of the fourth full day, which is reckoned from sunset to sunset. Now let's look at this chart. This chart is showing us the days of Nisan 14 through Nisan 18. And we're going to start with Wednesday. Wednesday is preparation day, the day that the Passover lamb is slain in preparation for the high Sabbath of unleavened bread, which is also called Passover. Yeshua died and was buried during darkness, and this was the beginning of his first night in the grave. Thursday is Nisan 15. It's the first day of unleavened bread. It's also the first high Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's also the first day that Yeshua was in the grave, and the second night he was in the grave. The next day is Friday, Nisan 16. It's the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but it's also preparation day of the weekly Sabbath. It's the second day and the third night that Yeshua is in the grave. Next is Saturday, Nisan 17th. 
This is the third day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It is the weekly Sabbath. It's also the third day, as well as the resurrection that takes place at sunset that evening. The next day is Sunday, Nisan 18th. This is the fourth day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. By this time, the grave is empty, and it is the day of first fruits, and this is when Yeshua was actually seen. Matthew 28, 1 says, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now what's wrong with this verse? Let me tell you, it has to do with the word Sabbath. It has to do with the way our English versions translate Sabbath. The problem is that the word sabbaton is a neuter genitive plural. It should say, now after the Sabbaths, and not now after the Sabbath. There were two Sabbaths that week, the High Sabbath, which is the first one for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Weekly Sabbath. It would be only later on the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread that you would have the second High Sabbath, or the last one. But in this time frame, what the writer of Matthew is telling us about is the fact that Yeshua rose from the dead after at least two Sabbaths. And we're oblivious to that because our translators failed to translate this properly. So by the time we actually see the new crescent moon, the new lunar month has already begun, and it began the moment after conjunction. Yet for all practical purposes, we need to have a day for the moon's death, which should be conjunction day, and a day for the moon's rebirth, which is the new crescent moon day. It's the day after conjunction, whether we see the new crescent or not, because even Yeshua himself was not actually seen, although he was resurrected, until Sunday in the morning. And remember, our days are still reckoned from sunset to sunset. Now recall that I said that thematic patterns that are found in Scripture can be seen in our own lives today. This is very true. I've seen this happen with myself. I've seen it in the lives of political leaders. And we just need to understand that it continues to happen whether we realize it or not. The pattern of the moon's phases is also the same that took place during the Jewish Shoah or the Holocaust. We had everyone living their lives, nothing was going wrong, and then next they fell out of favor with the Germans. And before you know it, the Holocaust took place. And then, at the appointed time, the rebirth of the nation of Israel took place. May Yehovah be praised. Again, my name is Beth Mahaffey with Highway to Holiness. I hope you've enjoyed patterns in Scripture. I hope that you're able to identify some of these along the way. But if not, and you're watching a future presentation, you might hear me refer to thematic patterns or I might just say pattern, and this is what I'm talking about. Until next time, Shalom.